Yeah, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here this morning. Before I forget, we've got uh, some new things uh, happening I'll talk about it in a minute, but one thing that is not in your program is a marriage conference coming up in March. And I know each one of you who are married will say, hey, that's for me. And the answer is, it's for you. Whatever uh, you have to do to uh, uh, make that work in your budget, you'll make it work. Whatever you need to do, you're going to find a way to be there because every one of us can have that opportunity to say, what, what do I not know? What can I learn? How can I be better as a husband, as a wife, and uh, grow in our marriage together? Um, Today, we are the first week of the new year, and we're going to start off with a brand new series, I Love My Church. And some of you are like going, hey, I've never been here before, I don't know if I love it or not. And some of you are like going, yeah, I tolerate it. Um, and some of you go, yeah, this is my church. And um, we, uh, we started the church 20 years ago, if you can believe it. 20 years ago this year, uh, we started the church, and we said, in order to have a place where people will love, where people say, hey, that's my church, you have to establish some foundational things. And the foundational person that Church on the Ridge is established upon is Jesus. He is first and foremost in all that we do. Anytime you see something that is not representative of Christ, uh, any one of you can come and you call it out to me and say, hey, pastor, when you flip that person off, that didn't look like Jesus. And uh, you'd be absolutely right that it would be not conducive for a follower of Christ, somebody who claims the name of Jesus, and for a church. So everything we do is based upon him, to love, to serve, to reach out, to be a blessing. And we, we put uh, some of the, some of the uh, uh, practical things and spiritual things in our core values. Every business, uh, it, maybe you, you've come up with some values of yourself, uh, for your home, for wh whatever it is, you have core values. And we're going to talk about our core values uh, through the next six weeks. Myself, uh, some of our pastors, some of our team members are going to come up here and share. And you're going to hear from a number of us about why we do the things we do and how we can be a, a part of that. Our core values, there's seven of them. And they're easy to remember because they're alliterated through ABCDEFG. Authenticity, we're going to talk about this morning. Biblical truth, what are the things that we believe? Culturally relevant, doing life together. Pastor Kevin, that's his favorite one. And he's going to uh, be talking about that because we have small groups starting soon. Excellence, fruitfulness, and growth. And, and so we're going to go through those and hopefully you'll go, yeah, I love my church. Hey, I didn't know those were the values of church. You know what? I, let's, let, let's promote those. Um, in 2024, we also set some goals. And what are the things that we feel like God wants us to do in 2024? What are the things he wants us to achieve? And we have three main ones. Uh, they're not in any particular order, but we're going to look back on the year and say, hey, did we accomplish this or not? 200 fully devoted followers of Christ. A fully devoted follower of Christ is someone who says, hey, I'm all in. Whatever God asked me to do, whatever the Lord wants me to do, the answer is yes. I think of myself there much of the time, but there are some things that I go, Lord, don't ask me to do that. You, 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 anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, I, I, I want to say yes to everything you asked me to do, but that one looks really hard. But Lord, let me be willing. I'm willing to say yes to everything you have. That's a fully devoted follower of Christ. God, I'm, I'm going to stop uh, negotiating with you. Well, hey, if you do this for me, and if I get this out of it, and what's, you know, what's, what's in it for me kind of thing. No, Lord, I'm in. All that you have, all that you want, all that you desire. I know it's going to be good for me. So my answer is yes. Uh, we want to see 200 people at the end of this year go, hey, that's me. That's me. Uh, 200 new students. Uh, are, you know, just kids just running around this place. And 200 more students than we have now. We have about 250 now. So we're, we're talking about almost doubling our student ministries and uh, just seeing that thing just explode. And then 200,000 that we give away to Compassion, uh, both locally and around the world. We're places that will not give back to us in some tangible way. Um, you, you know, sometimes we, we're not, some, some of the things we do is our 4th of July or Halloween outreach. The whole intent is to get people to come to Church on the Ridge. Hey, let them see this place and go, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check that place out. But when we talk about our Compassion Fund, our missions opportunities, we're giving money away that, in, in effect, will have no tangible impact on us. They're not going to come to church here. They're not going to serve us in some way. It's simply given away to help people encounter Christ, be fed, uh, be clothed, be sheltered, uh, be ministered to in some way that they wouldn't be if we did not uh, serve them that way. So today, we're going to jump into our core values. Authenticity. Authenticity. The dictionary defines authenticity as the quality of being real. The quality of being real. And you go, oh yeah, okay, that's cool. I, uh, I watched this guy on a, a talk, and uh, 
I uh, anyway, just watch it. This is his. This is his version. What he. How many of you believe in the universal law of attraction? Because if you don't, you're about to. Because for 22 years, I never believed in any of that spiritual mumbo jumbo. Until one jumbo. day, I found a law in the physical universe. It's called constructive interference, and it says that when two wavelengths of equal length meet, the size of the frequency doubles. What this means is that you can get energy from conversation. You can get energy from the people around you, or they can take energy away. From you. And so I started to go down this spiritual rabbit hole and I found a research project called the Spain Scale of Emotion, S-P-A-N-E. Researchers were able to take 25,000 subjects and put them in a room and they were able to measure the frequency leaving the human body. And do you know what the most powerful frequency to leave the human body is? The frequency of authenticity. Authenticity is 4,000 times more powerful than love. Do you know when authenticity happens? Authenticity happens when your words are truthful and you believe what you're saying. Now, I have not done any research on this guy. I couldn't even tell you his name. I've not done a background check and tried to determine if his research is valid or in any way. But I liked what he said, and I went, you know what? I don't know if it's 4,000 times more powerful than love, but there is a truth to that that each of you know instinctively or in intuitively. When somebody is being genuine and real, you lean in, and when somebody is being fake, you go, uh, some of you have a really good fake meter. You can, you can spot a fake like that. My wife's one of these people. She can spot a fake, and she'll go, Charlie, but don't. I go, no, 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 they're great, they're great. And, and I'm gonna come back and go, yeah, they're selling Amway. Uh, and if you're selling Amway, God bless you, God bless you, as long as you tithe, no big deal. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> When we're authentic, people tend to like us. When we're authentic, people tend to like us. But we've all experienced what it means to be authentic. The possibility or the reality of rejection. When I show you who I am, it opens a door for some real rejection. And the fear of that rejection is one of the greatest human fears in our psyche. I will do most anything to keep from being rejected. To put it in a positive way, uh, the desire to be accepted and affirmed is one of the greatest human motivators that we have. The desire to be accepted and affirmed. So the opposite of being rejected. I want to be affirmed. What will I do to get you to affirm me? And we will spend billions of dollars, maybe it's in the trillions now, to change the way we look, to change the way we appear, to change our body shape, to surgeries, uh, all kinds of things, just so that people won't reject me. What I've discovered in my own life, when I'm rejected, two things happen. Two things happen. Um, it pushes me to be inauthentic. I'm going to do what's not really me to keep that from happening again. If you've, if you've ever you know, uh, been called upon in class and you didn't have the answer and you, know, you, you were shamed in that place, okay, I'm never gonna raise my hand again. I think I have the answer, but I'm not gonna say it because no, nope, that, that's too painful. Uh, have you ever sung in public and somebody laughed at you and you love to sing, it's part of who you are, but you said, no, nope, I'm never gonna do that again. You become an inauthentic version of yourself. Um, when I was in junior high, I went out for football. Now, I, didn't, I was not raised in a football family. I was not raised in a sports family. My dad didn't teach me how to play sports, didn't, didn't really understand them. But hey, you know, I want to go out for football, looks like fun. And I remember the pass was thrown to me, and it was a beautiful pass, just a perfect pass. It was, you know, could not have been more perfect. And I dropped the pass, and the whole team turns to me and says, don't uh, catch the ball before you catch the ball before you run. I didn't know that. And there, everybody else knew it. I didn't know it. And you know what? I never went out for football again. I wanted to play, but I did not want to experience the rejection um, until I went to college. Then I went out for football. So not ever again. But uh, all that is shame-based rejection. Shame-based rejection. And the second thing it does is it not only pushes me to be on the thing, but it pushes me to reject others. I, it, you know, hey, if everyone's piling on this guy, I'll jump in the pile and pile it on so that I'm not the one being laughed at. Right? I'll reject you first so that you don't reject me kind of thing. And I'll be inauthentic and I'll fake just to be accepted. Now, now hear this. Uh, when, when, we, when we dress, like, dress nice or, or pay for a nice haircut or whatever it is that you do, none of that's a problem. Honestly, that is not the issue. It's when we do it, 
purely for the, the desire to be accepted is when it becomes inauthentic. This is not really me, but I'm going to put this on because I know people like me better or something like that. We're trying to gain someone's approval. Uh, let me ask you this. Yeah, don't, don't raise your hand. All right. Yeah. Ever cheated on a test? You ever plagiarized a paper? Um, you ever lied on a job application? Uh, it, it, it embellished your abilities? Maybe post it on Facebook when you knew the vacation was really not quite that good, but you, you, whatever. And, and, and what happened? You got the best grade. Wow. Your paper won the award. You got the job. You got the promotion that you're looking for. Uh, you got the most likes on social media, man. Oh, wow. And everyone's fist bumping you and high five is, man, good job. Wow, that was so great. And you're receiving approval, kind of. But, but you know that it's not really you. It's, it's the fake you that's getting the approval, so it's a little empty, it's a little less, it's a little something. Um, let me ask you, what are the things that you tend to do to gain approval, to be accepted? I'm going to give you 15 seconds. If, if you're really, well, no, if, you, if you're one, if someone that uh, likes to write things down, you might even write this down in your note. Here are the things that I do. I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Think about it. Maybe write it down in your notes. Here are the things that I tend to do in my inauthentic self. Now, it's not fair if your spouse is telling you those things that you do. <laughs> I want to look today in the Bible at two people. Um, one of them was an authentic version of themselves, and the other one was an inauthentic version of themselves. Uh, one guy had gotten passed over for promotion, and it began to eat away at him. Instead of recognizing his own abilities and accepting himself for who he was, he felt the rejection deep down. His name was Joab, Joab, a guy in your Bible. And um, on the surface, he acted like everything was fine, but inside, Things were not so good. The other guy, it's his first cousin. His name is Amasa. And he got the promotion that Joab wanted. So he is the guy on, you know, on top, seemingly on top, and lives his life for the most part in an authentic way, or tries to live his life in an authentic way. And we've all experienced that kind of rejection. You got passed over on a job, you, you, didn't, you didn't make the team. Uh, you didn't win the award. Uh, somebody else got voted in. Somebody else was the beauty queen. I have a gal on our, on our team here at church who told me, uh, you know, I was runner-up to Rosie O'Donnell. I should have won homecoming queen, but she got it. And I go, seriously, Rosie O'Donnell? Do you Rosie? He goes, yes. Yeah, she was nothing back then. I was something. And, you know, still a little bitter, are you? Uh, so Joe Abbott and Mesa are cousins, all right? Commanding general of David's army. Amasa is. And uh, here we go. We're not going to read the whole story. We're going to read a little portion, a little tiny portion of the story. It's in your notes. It's on the screen on my sites. While they were at the great rock of Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Joab was wearing his military tunic. So they're, they're out doing battle. Now they're they're going to meet up. And Joab in his military tunic and strapped over it, his waist was a belt with a dagger in its sheath. As he stepped forward, it dropped out of its sheath. So most commentators tell us that Joab had this intentionally planned. He said, hey, I'm going to set up my dagger so that if I turn just the right way or bump it just right or pull just the right string, the dagger will fall out. And as he's moving towards his commander, his cousin, he reaches down with his left, he makes this thing fall out, and oh, sorry, it fell out. You know, okay, hey, I'm, I'm coming. And he picks it up, and instead of taking the time to put it back in its sheath, he's just holding his hand, and look what happens. Joab said to Amasa, how are you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand and kissed him. So you can see this, you know, in ancient Eastern uh, uh, culture. Here we go. Amasa was not on his guard against the dagger in Joab's hand, and Joab plunged it into his belly, and his guts, sorry, his intestines spilled out on the ground. Without being stabbed again, 
Amasa died. Now, isn't that a wonderful uplifting story for your start of the new year Sunday? Wow, this is just wonderful, Pastor. Thank you. You know, Pastor, and, and besides that, that was years ago. That was like old, old Bible stuff. That was, you know, thousands of years ago. What in the world does that have to do with today? Anybody know the name Wanda Holloway? Anybody in the cheerleading world? In Texas, in Houston, Texas, Wanda Holloway's daughter went out for junior high cheerleading, kind of like my junior high football experience. One of Wanda Holloway's daughter's friends was also going out for cheerleading and stood a chance to make the team instead of Wanda's daughter. Wanda hires or attempts to hire a hitman to have the little, I'm, I'm only smiling because it didn't happen, but uh, to have the mom of the little girl who was trying out against her daughter killed. Yeah. Yeah, Google it. It's a, it's a crazy story. What crazy? Wow. Anyone hear of, ever hear of a, a lady named Tanya Hardy? <laughs> She's kind of closer to home, right? It's not longer in Texas. We're talking about right here in our backyard. You know, Tanya Hardy hired a guy to crack the knees of her rival. Hey, I want that. Uh, okay, so, uh, some others. Uh, ever hear of Barry Bonds? Uh, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa? Yeah? Right? Okay. They have the asterisk by their name because they wanted to be the best. And, uh, you know, really it belongs to Roger Maris, but, you know, that's, that's a whole debate. Uh, how, about, how about Lance Armstrong? Wow, America's brightest and finest and fastest in all the world, man. I don't know, it's 17 or 300, you know, uh, whatever those r races are. How many? Seven? Seven of those races. Yeah! Let's beat those Europeans. Yeah, way to go, America! only to find out that he was juicing, right? PEDs. You go, huh. So maybe it's not just an ancient age-old thing. And if I got into your world for a little bit, <clears throat> I might find some vestiges of that in you. Some things in you that says, well, I want to get ahead. Um, each one of these people got great affirmation until it was discovered until the asterisk came. And the very thing that they were looking for became the opposite, the thing they hated, rejection, rejection. Joab accentuates the same thing today. In a game that we all play, number one in your notes, it's the game of how are you my brother? How are you my sister? How are you? How are you? Now, um, we play it a little bit different than Joab does. We don't grab him by the beard and kiss him. We just reach out our hand and say, hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? And, and, and you know what's crazy is you've grown up with this game your whole life because it's been around since the beginning of time. And you know how to play it. You play it well. You walk up to somebody and say, hey, how are you? And they say, fine, how are you? You guys got it. The rules are simple. I'm fine. You're fine. We're all fine. Everybody's great. Um, Smile and you shake their hands, you walk away. I, you know, as a pastor, every church that I've pastored has mastered this game. You know, even Church on the Ridge, we we're really good at it. You walk through the door, you meet and greet, how are you? Fine, good, I'm fine. Someone asked me once, do you believe in miracles like today, like real miracles today? I go, oh yeah, absolutely. So they happen in my church every Sunday. Really? Miracles in your church? Yes, every Sunday. You won't believe it. Here'll be a couple. They're getting ready for church, and, and the wife is just a little bit slower than he ought to be, and the kids don't have their socks. Or the dad hates being late, so he's trying to get everybody out the door, but it's been a real problem because she doesn't have her makeup on yet, and this kid is screaming. So finally, he just goes and sits out in the car and makes the wife get all the kids into the car. Finally, he says, hey, I told you guys I need to get out of here, and you guys just keep dinking around. And so he finally pulls out of the driveway, takes the corner a little fast, just kind of misses the stop sign, and she says, you know, that was a stop sign. And he says, you know, I've been driving longer than you have. And by the time they get to the church, not a kind word has been said. There's a lot of ice coming on the inside of the car because it's really quiet. And they park in our parking lot here, and they open the doors, and all of a sudden, the clouds part. <laughs> a shaft of light from heaven comes down because they walk to the front doors. And they says, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm wonderful, blessed of the Lord. God is so good. Man. And the wife's got a big smile and trying to keep the kid from screaming, you know, just get him in. And we begin to sing the songs, I love Jesus, I hate my wife, but I love Jesus. <laughs> it's a miracle! How? 
See, churches teach us to inadvertently be fake, to be inauthentic. Because if you're having a bad day, it means something's wrong with you. Job showed us this, way back in the book of Job. Job believed that, uh, Job's friends and the culture there believed that if you, if bad things are happening to you, it must be because of something you've done wrong. You're not spiritual enough, you don't read your Bible enough, you don't pray enough, you don't have enough faith. There's something wrong with you. We're not allowed to have a bad day. And I learned a little secret. 20 years of pastoring here, not everyone who walks through those doors is fine. There's some people, they're having a bad day. Do you realize that even Jesus, Jesus, the one we sang and worshiped all you know, through the Christmas season, that Jesus had a bad day, had many bad days. The most famous one is something you learned in Sunday school, the shortest scripture in all the Bible, two words, John 11:35, 35, Jesus wept. One of his best friends had just died. He's watching the family grieve as they're going through this and wondering, and, and, and God, why, 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 asking the question. And he sees what death does, and he sees the pain that it causes, and he begins to weep. And it's not just a little tear. It is a violent, utter agony of his soul. And he knows what he came to do to set us free from that kind of rejection, the ultimate rejection of death. And he's having a bad day. I wonder what it would look like if we created a church that didn't use the fear of rejection or shame to motivate people, become fully devoted followers of Christ, that didn't have to fake it, but they, you know, I, I, I want to believe, I, I want to be there, but I'm not sure, but man, can you help me get there instead of, oh yeah, I'm a fully devoted follower of Jesus, and well, he asked me something, and then I just... What would it be if we'd just be real? You know, my wife and I are struggling. Why don't we put on a marriage conference? Because we think everybody's marriage is just wonderful. You guys try to pretend. No. Most marriages are mediocre. And that's not what you signed up for. But you can't say it in church. We play the game. Uh, yeah, the Bible says... Uh, the Bible tells about fully devoted of Christ. Ephesians 4, 35, 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. This is the command of the early church. Ephesians 4 is a real picture of how to do church um, today. Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. What is that? We're connected. You don't lie to yourself. Now, you can try, but you know the truth. I cheated on that paper. I didn't really get that promotion. I mean, I did, but I didn't, you know. Uh, you know the truth. You know, we, we don't, but what if it was true for us as members? Hey, I know you're not perfect, but that's okay. You know, we don't have to always be fine. It's all right to let them see us sweat. I want to be real. What's the reward for winning? Because the lie is that whoever plays the game the best wins. What's the reward for winning? Well, it's a little word called loneliness. Play the game right, you'll never be rejected. Always put the right post on your, on your social media. Man, people will always give you good likes, right? Tell everyone you're always fine. Talk about all the things you've done. And, hey, man, how many things you, you know, you at work, you're always, you know, pumping it up and sharing the stuff, the great things in your life. And best marriage, best kids, best life. And no matter how bad you've been hurt, you never let them see and some of us have been rejected by our own family there's a scripture in Psalm 27 that says even my father and my mother have forsaken me and you know the pain of that rejection of wow the people closest to the people in your own family the reality is it hurts the guy who should have been on your side that was Joab and Amasa Joab should have been on Amasa's side and said, hey, commander, man, let me, let me do my best for you. And not only that, we're cousins. And we grew up together. Let's take this, this hill for Christ, for God. And instead he turns on him and kills him. We see it in marriage. Couples fighting each other instead of supporting and building each other up and protecting each other. They're killing each other. Well, not literally. 
But it's that one word, that one phrase, and their guts spill out, and that's all you need to say because that did it. And now you're on top. And the other person is laying in the puddle, but you win, and you feel good until you're alone, and the marriage is done. But no one knows because you're really good at how are you. You know why people stop coming to Church on the Ridge? Actually, any church, but Church on the Ridge. Number one reason, because they're lonely. Oh, they may have met a bunch of people, but they never got close enough for someone to say, I know you. And, and they learned how to play the game really well, and they came in and played it, but they said, you know, I can be fake anywhere. I don't need to go to church to be fake. Isn't church supposed to be a place where you're accepted for who you are? Oh. I thought maybe I could finally be known for just the authentic me. I guess church is just another place to play the game, how are you, and whoever plays it best. See, if winning is loneliness, how do we lose? How do we lose? Number three, we lose when we let people get close enough to kiss us. We lose when we let people get close enough to kiss. But pastor, uh, Mesa did that and it got him killed. Uh, seriously? Well, what happens when you get close enough to somebody to kiss them? Oh, you see their wrinkles. You see what's behind the makeup. You see their real hair color. <laughs> you smell their real breath. Notice it says, Amasa was not on his guard. Amasa was not on his guard. Amasa said, I'm done playing that game. He didn't get to be the commander of David's army by being fake and inauthentic. He said, no, I'm going to do it. I want intimacy that comes from allowing you to see me for who I really am. I'm going to stop trying to put up a facade, put up a mask around me, and I'm not going to play the game. But in order for people to get close enough to kiss you, you also have to let them be close enough to kill you. C.S. Lewis said this about <clears throat> keeping our hearts from being rejected. How, how can, how, you can you can keep your heart from being rejected? You can. You can you can put it in, in, and keep it. Here, here, here's what. Let me just read this quote. Uh, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. That, to me, is a picture of hell. Oh, I've never been rejected, but I am terribly alone the recesses of my own heart, the recesses of my own life. I gave my life to another guy who let someone get close enough to kiss him. You know him, or you know about him. Enough to kiss him and to kill him. You know the story. In Luke chapter 22, he records it like this. While he was still speaking, a crowd arrived, led by the man called Judas, one of the twelve, he approached Jesus to kiss him. You know the rest of the story, but in that little phrase, in that little scripture, is the entire Bible, the gospel, the good news. It's all right there. You have been rejected. You've been hurt by family, friends, spouse, kids. And now the tendency is to hurt others and to lock ourselves away, hiding behind the guard and lonely. And Jesus says, I have never hurt another. 
He didn't only say it, but he walked it out. I have never hurt another individual, and I will let you get close, and I will die for you so you can be restored. I will never reject you. That fear that you have will never come from me. You are welcome to come to me even if you want to kiss me and kill me. This is who I am. It's what I came for. I will allow myself to be rejected and be vulnerable and be real. I will hang on the cross exposed before the world, taking every act of rejection that you have done to someone else. On myself. So you can be restored. So you can be accepted. I will even take the ultimate rejection of my own father. You see, not all rejection is the same. It doesn't all have the same weight. Certain people can know the authentic you and reject you, and it doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother you. Rejection only hurts when it comes from a person you value. That's why somebody at work can say something to you and it rolls off and your wife says it and you are devastated. You, you can't get up the next morning. When the person you value most accepts you, the rejection of others is diminished. When the person you value the most accepts you, the rejection of others is diminished. That psalm I read, Psalm 27 of David, my own father and mother have abandoned me. I didn't finish it because he wrote on to say, but the Lord will hold me close. I love my mom and dad, but the Lord I've given my life to. The Lord I've put my hand in his. The Lord accepts me. Many have not encountered this Lord of David's and you're living in an inauthentic way. But when you encounter Jesus, you begin to see that he loves you with your flaws. When you've truly encountered him, you can be authentic, really you, really free. No hiding, no pretending, because the one you value most, there's never any rejection. And here's what's amazing. One of the attributes of Jesus is he's omniscient, meaning he, he knows everything. So he's seen all those flaws, all those things in your life that you want to hide, that you don't want anyone to see. He's already seen them. He says, hey, come here and let me give you a kiss. I love you. I love you. You, you, you can't hide from me the times you've cheated on your tests and plagiarized papers and embellished and all the stuff. I love you. And he wants you to grow in the grace to live an authentic life in his love. Accepting him allows you to love others for how God created them, not how you want them to be. You always wanted to change the people around you because it's a reflection on you. Instead, your worth and value comes from the one you've committed your life to, you value the most. And your husband can be a little bit less than what you thought he was or ought to be. Your kids don't have to get all the grades that you think that they ought to get because you're affirmed by him. You can accept and love others. You can allow them in and let your guard down. Here at Church on the Ridge, we will never reject you. It's part of our core values. 20 years ago, we said, hey, let's do our best to make this a place where people with issues, people who aren't fine, come in. And if you will be one of those 200 fully devoted followers of Christ, we will commit to live authentically, accepting one another. And then what happens, it's like that guy said in the video, people are drawn to us. I can get the other anywhere. Where can I go where the pastor admits that he's a sinner? Hey, you guys didn't know that? And the people don't play the game, or at least the core don't, right? It takes a while for you to break down that barrier. In our small group, it's been fun watching the barrier come down and people becoming more and more trusting, saying, hey, hey, this is who I am. 
accepting others is not the same as accepting sin. Though some of you are going to leave here and go, hey, that's not love, accepting sin. Grace and truth have to go together. Jesus loves you where you are and loves you enough not to leave you there. But to be authentic is actually to be like Jesus. Let me, let me close. Um, any of you, you see those signs, of authentic Chinese food or authentic Mexican food or authentic mom's meatloaf, right? And you go in there, all right, we're going to get mom's meatloaf. This is just going to be great. And man, you're ready to go. And you sit down, you eat that, and you go, I, nah, it's all right, but it's not authentic mom's meatloaf. And, and you go home and, you know, mom, mom, you got to make that meatloaf. There's nothing like authentic mom's meatloaf. That's like authentic, the real thing. What do you got to do? Mom, what's your recipe? You got to go back to the creator. God, what's your recipe? Because everyone wants to sprinkle all kinds of different ingredients into your life so that you can be accepted and affirmed and you got to wear the right shoes. You got to wear, it's a thing, yes. <laughs> Pray for me. You got you to wear the right clothes. You got to be the right, you got to say the right stuff and never let them see you sweat and they sprinkle all this stuff and you never quite taste until we go back to the Father. So I made you you, uniquely you. I made you as tall as you are, as short as you are, as wide as you are, as skinny as you are, as nosy as you are, as smart as... I made you. That's you that I love. You'll never, ever feel the love, the freedom, until you encounter me, who made you and loves you. And maybe you want to join us on this journey in 2024. It's a brand new season for Church on the Ridge. It really is. 20 years. We can look back and go, yay. But God says, do not put old wine into new wineskins. And he wants to do something new. And he wants to do it in the people in this room. We'll say, hey, I don't know if we'll get there. I don't know if we'll do it perfectly. I don't know if I can. start my own family. But if we can do it here, people flock to this place. Your friends who post the perfect people. And you won't do that. You'll go, of course. Of course. Come on in. Let me kiss you. Let me, oh, that's mom. And the meatloaf's fine. Let's pray. Maybe that's you this morning. You wrote some things down in your paper. You hid them in your heart about how you're inauthentic. And you know that it's real. You know that's really new. You know it's real in your marriage. You, you're, you're one of those people. And I, my wife and I are great at it. We played the game really well. We look good in church. And look like hell at home. And today you want to say, you know what? I don't know. Jesus, do you really love me for who I am? How the world rejected you. for being a part of this really good, 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 great church. Um, look forward to this series. Uh, if you need prayer this morning, our prayer team, Liz and Ted are there. If you need healing, uh, God, uh, just, hey, I need God's grace in some area of my life. Let them pray over you. Let them pray the prayer of faith over you. And let me just make this last comment. Some of you came in and there was a fire truck outside. The paramedics were here. Dear family in our church, Dan, Dan and Dana Arner, their little girl fell and really messed up her, her face, probably broke her front teeth. She's a special needs little girl, Sierra. And um, so be praying for them. But if you saw that, they're, they're being taken care of. And, and uh, we love them. If you want to reach out to them, that's, that's cool too. Prayer team is here.
God bless you guys. Don't miss next week, all right? And uh, go Ducks. Oh, yeah. Liberty. How did we get Liberty University? Whoa. All right, Huskies. (laughs) 